I'd like to, to welcome our presenter, Dr. Lisa Lang, who is the President of Science of Business, an international consulting firm specializing in helping companies achieve bottom line results through the application of the theory of constraints, Lean and Six Sigma. She's one of the few TOC experts recognized worldwide by Dr. Goldratt, developer of the theory of constraints and the author of the best-selling business novel, The Goal. She's also served as the global marketing director for Goldratt Consulting. Lisa's worked in a wide variety of industries, helping clients and executives <coughs> at the executive level with strategic planning, growth management, in, and in all functional areas, including manufacturing, R&D, engineering, distribution, and sales and marketing. Her insistence on focus and tying projects to the bottom line results has led Dr. Lisa to being referred to, being referred to as Dr. Lisa, the business doctor, by many of her clients. The Science of Business is an MTMA National Associate member since January of 2008 and has been a regular contributor to the MTMA record. I, on, the, on personal disclosure, I've worked with uh, Dr. Lisa since 2002 on and off. She's uh, given uh, my firm many great ideas that uh, we've implemented. Uh, some of you that may be in business have heard her speak. She's a common speaker. In fact, John, uh, John Darwin in Hamill has uh, uh, heard her speak and implemented some things at, at Hamill based on that. I'm willing to give the first person a dollar here, not, not 20, one dollar, <laughs> because after she's done, somebody's going to come up and say, that's a really good idea and stuff, and it'll work in other businesses, but it'll never work in my business. I did that. I, I told her, God, this, this, this mafia offer you've given us won't work. Nobody will ever pay that much. And I was wrong. I went ahead and tried it, and I was wrong, and, and it really helped re audit through some hard times. They got us some really good customers. So please keep an open mind. It's out of the box thinking and help me and welcome me, Dr. Lisa Lang. Um, don't forget your mafia offer. You've got some work to do this afternoon. So, you know, don't take too quick. Colorado. They were great. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about making money. And I'm going to give you the theory of constraints view of how to increase sales and profits. And we're going to, we're going to do that in the light of uncertain times. So it's a, even if you've heard me speak before, it's a slightly different presentation than I normally give. And to get you started on understanding theory of constraints, I brought a little prof that makes me really popular with TSA. This is here is a chain, and for those of you in the back, let me just describe what we have here. This chain is made up of all different kinds of links. Here at the top, there's an orange, pretty substantial metal link here. Here I have a very intricate, very expensive gold link. I have a purple string. I have this yellow plastic link. And towards the bottom here is the smallest link, but it's really, really strong. So I have all different types of links here in my chain. Now, this chain, the goal of this chain, is to hold the maximum amount of weight possible. And in order to hold that weight, each link must participate in that. So I have a goal, and I have interdependency. Now, I point that out because that meets the definition of a system. And our companies are really systems. So the way that we're taught to run a system, particularly a complex system like our companies, is to break it up into pieces. So what we do is we give each person responsibility for a different link in the chain. We allocate budgets. We tell everybody, okay, you understand the goal of our organization here. It's to hold the maximum amount of weight possible. Let's have a great year. And everybody goes and works on their area of responsibility or their link in the chain. And let's say that we did that and each of you went and worked on your link in the chain. And the only thing we know for sure at this point is if you had a budget, you probably spent all of it because you don't want to do battle the next year for the same amount. So you probably went, you worked on your link in the chain, you spent the whole budget, but we start to evaluate how did we do? What impact did we have on our goal to hold more weight? Well, let's say that, let me get some names down here. Russ here has responsibility for this intricate, very expensive gold link. And Russ works really hard this year. He takes his budget and he doubles the strength of it. Great job. 
and Rick Graydon has the purple string. Now, <laughs> Grady has the purple string, again, worked really hard, took his budget, and doubled his strength. And Roger has the yellow posse link. Again, hard worker, took his budget, and doubled his strength. But we start to evaluate, how do we do? Our goal is to hold more weight. When we double the strength of this intricate, expensive gold link and this yellow plastic link, what impact do we have on our system and our goal to hold more weight? None. Why not? Great is still the weakest link. See, despite the fact that all of you worked on your link in the chain, you worked really hard, and you maybe got some great results. Despite all of that, the only time we had an impact was when we strengthened the weakest link. So that's sort of the uh, Cliff Notes version of theory of constraints. What we try to do is focus on the thing that's limiting our ability to make more of our goal, and in our case, to make more money. What is the one thing that's limiting us from making more money? Okay, so let's jump into the presentation. So if the weakest link in our chain determines the performance of the chain, then the constraint determines the performance of our company. And one of the things we're dealing with right now are probably some unfamiliar constraints. We're, probably, we're used to bottlenecks in operations. That we're used to. And we're good at dealing with those. And man, have we gotten really good at dealing with those. But now in these uncertain times, marketing is starting to become sales constraint. Right? We might even see a cash constraint. These are things we're not used to dealing with. So for us to maximize our profitability, wherever that constraint is, we must focus on and leverage it. And if we can do that, then we can increase our profits. So what I want to do is start with this mafia offer concept. Now, I'll give you the definition, and we're going to start with an example. Now, the definition of a mafia offer is an offer so good that when your customers hear it, they can't refuse it and your competition can't or won't offer the same thing. That's the definition of a mafia offer. So now let me give you an example one. And for those of you, I see a few of you have printed slides that I had, I've deviated from them, so I apologize. I learned a lot this week, so I've updated my presentation. And um, you will get an updated handout, either from Sandy or from myself towards, towards the end. We'll up, send you the updated file. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story from the printing industry. Brad and I tend to work in two main types of industry. One is the printing industry, and we also own a printing company, and the other is the machining industry, and we have a profits interest in the machining company. And whenever I talk to the printing industry, I tell them stories from your industry, and when I talk to you, I tell you stories from the printing industry because of two main reasons. One is that when I hit too close to home, it evokes the, oh, that won't work for me. The second, probably more important reason is confidentiality. So I'm going to tell you some printing uh, stories and concepts, and I think you'll be able to, to relate and draw conclusions from them. And if you can't, just ask the questions. So you guys can feel free to raise your hands and, and ask questions at any time. Okay, so I was working with a printing company, and when I first started working with them, they had read the goal and had made some improvements on their own. They had gone from a quoted lead time of four to six weeks down to two weeks. And they did that before I got there on their own from reading the goal. And during that time, sales remained constant. So they made these big improvements while sales remained constant, which meant when I showed up, the constraint had moved. If you uncover that much capacity, your constraint moves internally from the printing press to where? Or would you guess? Sales, the market. And that's exactly what had happened here. So they had a market constraint. So when I came in, one of the first things I did is I, I wanted to find out what they had done up to that point. They had achieved some great results, so I wanted them to be able to tell me about the results. They were very proud of them. And I asked them, so you went from four to six weeks down to two weeks, is that correct? And very proudly they said, yes, we did. Wow, that's fantastic. And you also went from... Uh, about mid-70s due date performance all the way up to 90%? And they said, yes, we did, and they were very proud. And do I understand correctly that you sales remain constant and you haven't laid off anybody? And they said, that's correct. I said, so you guys have some excess capacity, right? 
And he said, that's why you're here. We have a ton of excess capacity. We would love to sell it. We don't want to have to lay out people. We would prefer to be able to sell it. So I said, I have only one question for you. If you have all this excess capacity, why is your due date performance only 90%? Well, they couldn't really answer that question, but they saw that there was something probably wrong. So anyway, I went out, I took a look at what they had done, and they implemented drum buffer rope that you can read about in the goal. By the way, how many of you have read the goal? Oh, I love this group. It was great. So they had implemented that, and there was one step that they forgot, and I'll explain those steps here in a little bit when we get to that point. But there was something that they didn't do. So one of the first things I did is I said, okay, let's, let's pick up the piece that you've missed. And within three months, their lead time went down to two days, and their unique performance all the way up to 99%. Now, here's why I started with the operations. When I asked them, what's your, what's your lead time? And they said they were now at two weeks. They were telling me the story. I said, well, where's the competition? And they said the competition is at about two weeks. And when they told me they went from 75% due date performance all the way up to 90%, I said, where's the competition? They said, well, the competition is at about 90%. And I said, you know, most of the time I ask that question, I get the answer, I don't know. I ask somebody, where's your competition? And usually they say, I don't know. How come you know the answer to this? And they said, well, when we were at four to six weeks, we were getting, starting to hear back from our customers that if we didn't improve, we were going to start to lose business. And they told us that competitive was, two week lead time, about 90% due date performance. So that's how they knew. And isn't it interesting that they only improved up to that point where they were the same as the competition? Okay? So that's, that was the why we started with the operations. I suspected that there was more there, and sure enough, there was. So we go down to two days and 99 plus percent due date performance. Okay, the next thing we need to do, we're going to create a mafia offer. There's three main things we look at to create a mafia offer. We look at your internal capabilities, either what they are or what they could be relative to the competition. The competition in this case was at two week lead time, about 90% due date performance, and we were now at two days and 99 plus percent. The second thing we look at is we look at your industry and how your industry sells whatever it is that you sell, because typically, the policies, procedures that you have and how you sell and deliver to your customers is very similar to all your competitors. We tend to do things very similar as an industry. Well, in the printing industry, if you've ever bought anything printed, and this one might even apply to some extent to this industry, they use something called a price quantity curve. Now, you want this price? No problem. You need to buy a bazillion labels. Oh, you only want one label? Here's the price. Everybody understand the price quantity curve? Everybody in the industry uses the price quantity curve. Now, the third area we have to look at to develop a monthly offer is your specific customers. So your customers are the only true judge of whether or not something's a monthly offer. So we need to look at your specific customers and see how are they impacted by the typical performance, two week lead time, 90% due date performance, and how are they impacted by the price quantity curve, how everybody sells to them. So we took a representative customer. In this case, it was a coffee roaster. The coffee roaster would look at the price quantity curve, says, I want that price. Now, to get that price, they have to buy about six months worth of labels. But the industry generally lets them spread all the labels they need to buy across that quantity. And in this industry, you're buying a lot of different labels. So a coffee roaster might roast 25 different varieties of coffee, put them in two size bags, or four size bags or something, they, they would need upwards of about 100 labels. So that was pretty common. Six months, about 100 labels to try to spread it across was pretty representative. Now, imagine you're a coffee roaster, you, you ordered the six months worth according to the price quantity curve. Now you have to decide how you're going to split that quantity. How many French roasts versus Colombian roasts in all these different size bags, how should you divide it up? Well, to do that, you're going to have to forecast out six months of how much of each variety of coffee in each size bag all of you are going to buy. Now, if you only know one thing about a forecast, what do you know? It's wrong. <laughs> that, that was a quick answer, wasn't it? It's wrong. The question is just how much and in which direction. The only thing we know for sure is it's going to be wrong. 
So what we did is we had to see, was it wrong? So I go into the customer service company, or to the customer service people at the label company, and I, and I ask them, hey, do you ever get frantic orders from customers who have stocked out of something? And they said, oh yes, we get those calls all the time. Well, what's all the time? They said, we get two to three of those calls a week. Wow. Well, does the opposite also happen? You know, do you, you ever, they're supposed to have six months worth of each label. Is there a label or several labels that they don't buy and it's been well over six months? And they said, sure, that happens. In fact, the label, the, the coffee roaster you were just asking us about called last week. They had stocked out of Colombian roast labels. They were frantic. Their lines were down. And he said, we'll get those out to you. We'll ship them UPS red, no problem. But while we have you on the phone, we noticed you haven't ordered French roast in over nine months. Would you like to place an order for the French roast as well? They said, we have enough French roast labels for our grandchildren. Just send the Colombian roast. The forecast was wrong. They, had, they were stocking out of some labels and at the same time had too many of other labels. The forecast was wrong. So what we did is we took all of this analysis, and this typically happens over a two and a half day boot camp, but this is sort of the Cliff Notes version of that. We took all that analysis, and we developed the following mafia offer. Now I'm going to tell you what the mafia offer is, not because I think it will work for you. Let me just say, even if there was a label company in the room, this may not work for you, because it has to be based on your specific capabilities, your industry, and your specific customers. Okay, fair enough, don't try this at home. I'm not saying that this is going to work for you guys, but here's, here's the offer. Mr. Customer, don't give us orders. Your orders are based on your best guess of how many labels you're going to need. We put that price quantity curve in front of you and make you forecast out six months. The forecast ends up being wrong and how could it possibly be right? Instead, tell us every day how many labels you use. Now, if you'll do that, we can guarantee on the one hand that you won't have to hold more than two weeks worth of labels. And you know how your marketing department's always wanting to do something? They want to put Spider-Man on the label one week and a couple weeks later put the Incredibles on there, but you can't do it because you have six months worth of labels? Now you only have two weeks. Now at the same time, we'll guarantee that we never stock you out. We'll guarantee that you'll never go to the shelf and not have the label you need. And if we ever do stock you out, we'll pay you $500 per day per label. Is that a mafia offer? What do you think? Yeah, that's pretty good, right? Okay, so it's unrefusable to the customer. The customer gets the best of both worlds. They go from six months of inventory to two weeks. Not bad for them. And they get guaranteed availability backed up with the penalty so they know that we're serious. Let's put it to the other test, though. What about the competition? Can the competition match this offer? No. no. Yeah, it, so our, we're asking the customer to hold two weeks' worth of inventory. What's our competitor's lead time? Two weeks. What's our due date performance? It's 90%. There is no way they can match that offer and not have to pay penalties. That's a mafia offer. And what they told me when we started was a commodity business. Does that make sense? What did you give for price? What we did, at least initially on price, is we, we offered this at the same competitive price. So they were buying some annual volume based on a price quantity curve. And we said, look, we're just going to match the price based on that annual volume. If your volume increases or it decreases, we'll adjust to what normal competitive pricing would be. So for the same competitive price, they get this deal. In this economy, is that a pretty good deal? You don't have to hold six months of something. So that's an example of a mafia offer. Probably a pretty compelling one. Yeah. What happened to the lot sizes or set up frequency of <laughs> That's a very good question. What happened? To do that offer, what are we going to have to do more of? Setups. What do we how do we feel about doing more setups? <laughs> Costs are going to go up, aren't they? So now what I want to take you through is what, how they had to change their thinking to do this. Because let, let's say that I started this conversation, I said, this is going to be your offer. Boy, that changes how you, you just view what I said, right? This is going to be your offer. The yes buts start rolling, right? 
Yes, but what about all the setups we're going to have to do? How are we going to do that? They went from four to six weeks lead time down to two days. How are we going to do that? To do this, they had to think completely differently. They had to totally challenge how they think. So what, what I want to take you through next is how, in what way, and how we did that. So reducing the lead times from four to six weeks to, do, to two days while sales remain constant, how is that possible? And of course, the short answer is they implemented drum buffer rope. But what the heck does that mean? So let me give you the sort of cliff notes version of that. We're back to old technology. They actually still had one of these. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about how we were taught to design our processes and typically how we were taught to run them. And I'm just going to draw a simple process here, and some of you have seen this diagram before. Let's say I have five steps in my process, and generally the flow is in this direction. So you could think of these as your routing or uh, departments, various departments you have. Now, Typically what we're taught to do is we're taught to balance capacity. And that was certainly what, would, what had happened at this, this label company, this printing company, they had balanced capacity. What balanced capacity means is that for each step in the process, on average, they could produce 20 per day. So it's very balanced. That's very efficient. And that's why most of us tend to balance our capacity because it drives efficiency. If we don't have any waste, then we're very efficient, right? Okay, well, if on average each step in the process can produce 20 per day, how many should I be able to produce every day? How many should come out? 20, you would think, right? Except what does an average of 20 mean? Yeah, sometimes we get out 23, sometimes we get out 17. On average, we get out 20 at each step. So I have here an average of 20. Okay, well, if 20 is the average, I can calculate the probability of ever getting 20 out. There's a 50% chance, 0.5, that I get a 20 at any one step, right? Because if 20 is the average, then there's a 50% chance I can get 20 or more out at each step. But I have here five circles in combination. We have interdependency between five circles, which means that I have to put that to the fifth. And I promise this is as tough as the math is going to get this morning. <laughs> I'm going to put that to the fifth. So the probability of ever getting 20 in the process that was perfectly designed to get 20 is 3.13%. Now, why is that? It's because of the variability, right? The variability is additive. The more steps in the process we have, have you ever noticed that if you have a job that has a really long routing, does it seem to, variability seem to pile up on it? Isn't it harder to get that job out than the job that has one or two process steps? The more steps you have to go through, the more departments you go through, the more that variability starts to add up. All right? Well, if I'm not going to get out 20, I'm only going to get out 20 or more 3% of the time, what, what is going to come out of this? Now, I did not know what the answer to that question was, but I've put this process into Excel. Excel has something called a Monte Carlo simulation. I said, let's assume that 20 is the average. We have five steps, and each step is plus or minus three variability. How many should I be able to get out? I ran that simulation a thousand times, and I got a distribution. The average of that distribution was less than 10, which I found a little bit too depressing. So I like to call this 10. The process perfectly designed to get 20 is going to get 20 or more 3% of the time, and most of the time, it's going to get out 10. Wasn't that interesting? OK, now let me ask you. If this were your process, or this is the process of the label company, where is their constraint? No, it's all over. It's all over, which it moves, right? So big job comes in, they start working on it. So big job comes in, we start working on it, we're at step A, where's the constraint? 
Where's the constraint? Step A. We passed the job from step A to step B. Now where's the constraint? B. B. And so on and so on. It moves. The constraint keeps wandering. Isn't it hard to leverage a moving target? That's what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to find our constraints. We're supposed to leverage them. But how do you do it when the darn thing is constantly moving around? So that's where the concept of drone buffer rope comes in. We know that most of us were taught balance capacity. And most of you, you probably don't know that these are 20s. What you know now as you think about your process is we can produce 10 a day. So most of us kind of lose after we've got our processes set up and going. We no longer track that they're, that what the average output is anymore. We just know what comes out of our system, and we tend we can see where the bottlenecks occur, and we tend to add capacity where the bottlenecks occur. So it occurs over here, so we add capacity, or we work over time over there, or, and then it moves over here, so then we address it over here, and then we move it over there. That's what we know. We don't know what the average output of each department is anymore. Okay, now let me create the situation where, I cr where we have a control point. So if you don't want to chase the constraint around, if you want to be able to leverage the constraint, then what you have to be able to do is unbalance capacity. We do the opposite. We're going to unbalance capacity. Okay? So I'm going to take step C here, and I'm going to make it the constraint by just turning it into a 15. Now that is clearly the constraint. In fact, there's quite a bit of excess capacity everywhere else. Probably so much excess capacity it makes us a little nervous. We're not comfortable with excess capacity because we're taught it's bad. We're, we're, we're taught about efficiencies. And so this is a pretty uncomfortable state. But let's talk about how we could potentially make more money if we did it. All right, well, I now have this control point, which in the book, The Goal, they call the drone. And by the way, in this situation, I may still very well have a market constraint. So I still have a market constraint. All I'm doing is creating an internal control point. So I call this step the drone. It's going to set the pace. No matter what happens, the most we're going to be able to get out of this process is whatever we can get through the drone. That's the concept of the drone. The drone is going to determine the rate at which we can go. Now once you realize that any time lost on step C is time lost for the entire output of the organization. So we want to make sure we don't lose any time there. So what do we do? We put a buffer of work in front of it. Let's make sure that that step doesn't run out of work. That's the only step I have to worry about efficiencies. That's the only step that I care that we don't lose capacity on. Every place else, by definition, has excess capacity. Okay, so now I have a buffer. Well, I need to do one other thing because step A and step B have capacity to work at the rate of 20. And if they have capacity to work at the rate of 20, they're going to work at the rate of 20. And they have access to the jobs that haven't been yet released into the system. So what they'll do is they'll work at the rate of 20 if we let them, and they'll shove all those jobs into the system. They'll just keep pushing them in, pushing them in, because we've taught them to do that. We go over and say, Gray, why aren't you busy? Why don't you have something to do? Oh, you don't have something to do? I'll find you something to do. They have been taught to work at their capacity, because that's how we measure them. We measure them on the efficiency. Okay? So we don't want them to work at the rate of 20. If they worked at the rate of 20, this buffer would get so big, it would defeat the purpose of the buffer. So what we, we, we do something called tying the rope. Now, we don't actually tie up employees. Well, one time, but that was a different situation. Tying the rope means whenever I take one out of the buffer, I can bring a new one in. It makes it forces these two resources to work at the rate of the constraint, to work at the rate of that control point, that drum, so that our buffer doesn't get huge. It gets whatever size we want it to be. Now, notice I have I set this system up so there would be quite a bit of excess capacity. And 25% X 25 to 30% excess capacity at non-constraints is a starting rule of thumb. But it's just, a, it's just a starting point. You might actually need more at some places, and you might be able to get away with less. And here's how we can tell. We take this buffer, and we divide it into three zones. A green zone, a yellow zone, and a red zone. And the second rule of thumb is we don't want to be in the red zone of the buffer almost empty and almost starving the constraint more than 5% of the time. 
Now we expect to go into the red zone some just due to variability, but we don't want to be in there more than 5% of the time. So that's how we would size the buffer. And here's why we start with 25%, we, that, which just seems to be a pretty big number. If the constraint, let's say the constraint's doing its thing, life is pretty good, the buffer's staying full, Murphy hasn't visited us lately, and we, we're, we're cruising. We're feeling pretty good about it. When all of a sudden, resource A gets a call from school, has a sick child to go pick up, and leaves. Or the machine goes down, or whatever it is that happens, but resource A is no longer working. That's okay. The constraint keeps working. The drum keeps working. That's what the buffers are there for. The buffers are there to absorb that variability. Now let's say that resource A comes back. And the buffer is em almost empty, but not quite. Resource A comes back. If resource A or resource B, either one, only have a little bit of excess capacity relative to the constraint, let's say that resource A was at 16, together resource A and resource B can only fill the buffer at the rate of 16, and the constraint is taking it out at the rate of 15, which means the buffer is filling very, very slow. And what's the probability you start to fill the buffer back up and Murphy strikes again? Anybody familiar with Murphy? Grady and I are pretty sure he, he lives in Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it were us, you know, we, we get the, um, we start filling up the buffer, we go in very slow, Murphy strikes again, then the buffer empties. And then any time lost on the constraint is lost in the entire organization. So the reason we start with 25% is because we need sprinting capacity. See, Lean only talks about two types of capacity, productive, and excess. We have a third type called protective or sprinting capacity, which is there to absorb that variability. So we need enough protective capacity to be able to quickly, if something happens, fill that buffer back up and protect our constraints. The other thing we do is we do the buffer statistics. Here's what buffer statistics are. Every time we go in the red zone of the buffer, we find out why. Every time we go in the red zone, why, why, why? Now that's only happening 5% of the time or less. But every time we go in there, we find out why. And after a while, we get a nice list of reasons. We then parade out those reasons and say, wow, 80% of the time when we're going into the red zone of the buffer is because of this step A. And it's happening whenever we have a new customer to enter into the system. And for some reason, whenever we have a new customer to enter into the system, it's taking us five days to do it. Now, I don't know why it's taking five days, but I now know where to focus my continuous improvement. So if you use any of the Lean tools, we can do a Kaizen event. And if you don't use Lean, Common Sense works pretty good. Go figure out why it's taking five days to enter a new customer into the system. And if we improve that, this is no longer 20. It's something greater than 20. And if that was the main reason we were going into the red zone of the buffer, we now might be able to reduce the size of the buffer. Now, the buffer, there's a buffer here, there's also a buffer at this end of the process. And all these buffers are doing is absorbing the variability, but they represent in this picture the amount of work and process we have. The amount of stuff we're working on, the amount of orders we have in-house, doesn't that affect our lead time? The amount of work and process we have directly impacts how long it takes us to do the work. So anytime we can reduce the amount of work and process, that's gonna reduce our lead time. If we can reduce our lead time, might we, be, might we create a competitive advantage? Maybe. For some of us, anyway, that might be a competitive advantage. And we continue. Every time we go in the red zone of the buffer, why, why, why? And the next reason is for because of resource B. And what's happening is we're going into the red zone because of the variability of that step. Sometimes it takes 30 minutes to do that step, and sometimes it takes three days. Now, I don't know why that is, but I now know where to focus my continuous improvement. If you use any of the Six Sigma techniques, and if you don't use Six Sigma, common sense works great, go figure out why it's taking, why the variability is so large at that step. And if we can reduce the variability of that step, and that was the main reason we were going into the red zone of the buffer. This is no longer 20, it's something greater than 20. We now might be able to reduce the size of the buffer. We reduce the size of the buffer, it reduces our work in process, reduces our work in process, reduces our lead time, reduces our lead time, sell more. 
Okay, so when I showed up at that label company, they had implemented this drum buffer rope. So this is drum buffer rope. They had implemented this process. The thing that they weren't doing when I got there is they weren't doing these buffer statistics and using that to focus their continuous improvement. So they went from four to six weeks, four to six weeks lead time down to two by essentially tying the rope, which cuts our work and process approximately in half because our whip reduces in half. They put the buffer in front of the constraint. They also had a shipping buffer. They did just that, and they went from 75% due to performance all the way up to 90, four to six weeks down to two. When I came in and figured out they weren't doing the buffer statistics, we added the buffer statistics, which allowed us to continually reduce the amount of work and process. It reduced the amount of buffer we needed, which allowed us to further reduce the lead time to two days, and due to performance went all the way to 99 plus percent. So this is what you read about in the goal, and this is how they applied it at the printing company. Any questions on this? That was the Cliff Notes version of the goal for anybody who hadn't read it. Questions? Excellent. There will be a quiz later. Okay, so the results from applying this drum buffer rope, by selecting the control point, you're better able to leverage your constraint. So once the constraint stops moving around, because you've chosen a control point, you said, this is where I'm going to pick my control point, the constraint stops moving around. Now we can actually leverage, and leverage is where all the power is. Tying the rope, so the rope portion, basically what that does is it reduces the work and process. It only lets us put work in at the rate that the constraint can actually do it, that the control point can actually do it. So the width reduces to half initially, and sometimes it even goes lower with continuous improvement. So it cuts our process time in half and also improves the due date performance. The buffers, there was a buffer in front of the drum, the constraint, and there was a shipping buffer. And what they're doing is they protect the drum to absorb the variability. The shipping buffer, all it does, you wouldn't have to have it, but if you actually want to be able to meet your customer commitments, it protects the date you gave to the customer. And again, these buffers are just absorbing the variability. And the buffer statistics, they allow us to focus our continuous improvement. So Lean and Six Sigma have some fantastic tools, and what we want to do is focus them where we can have a bottom line impact. Reducing waste, reducing variability, great things. Let's make sure that we can focus them where we can have a bottom line impact, where it can allow us to reduce our width, allow us to get more out. So other benefits, cash flow improves. This is a nice side effect because our jobs spend less time in process. We don't have raw materials sitting around as much, and when we start on it, we get them finished much sooner. So the cash situation improves. And by choosing a control point and using the system, if you do need to cut people, so if for whatever reason we can't come up with a monthly offer for you, or the monthly offer doesn't work right now, or whatever it is, and you actually need to cut people, with this kind of system, it's easier to tell where to cut to have a minimal bottom line impact, or minimal effect on your ability to deliver. So we'll be able to tell by what we've never gone into the red zone because of resource B. We must have quite a bit of protective capacity at resource B. It's so much so that we probably have some excess capacity there, and that might be a good place to cut and have little effect on our ability to deliver. So that's what I mean by that. It can help you figure out where to cut and have the least impact on your ability to deliver. And it also allows you to leverage your market constraints. So why are we talking about operations at all in this environment? Because that label company would not have been able to make that offer without doing this. When I got there, they had a market constraint already. They already had a market constraint. But they were at the same ability as their competition. They were at a two-week lead time and 90% due date performance. How do you create a competitive advantage when you're the same as everybody else? 
So that's why even in this economy, the offside, there's a huge opportunity here. And think about it. So the label company has this great offer. They have this system in place. Their competitors are starting to cut people. When their competitors start to cut people, what's going to happen to their competitors' lead time? It's going to start to increase. What's going to happen to their due date performance? It's going to get worse. Meanwhile, we've improved operations. If we need to cut, we know where we can do it with the least impact. But ideally, with this offer, we would go out and sell more. So does that make sense to everybody? Why still talk about operations? Why is operations still important in this environment? And now's a good time to be making these changes. If, you're, if your sales are down, if you have a market constraint, now's a good time to start making those improvements. Now, what else did they do? And we, we hit on this earlier. They had to challenge how they fundamentally did business. Harry's question about, well, what about the setups? Well, that's why the price quantity curve existed. The price quantity curve was there to save setups. All right, well, let's talk about how we had to rethink that. Because if you, if you knew that that was your offer and, and, you, and you're blocked by the fact that my cost will increase, you're not going to go there. But is that, the real, is that the real situation? So let me give you a couple key definitions. We look at financials a little bit differently. I should say we look at everything a little bit differently. But in particular, here's the financial definitions and how we look at them differently. The first definition is operating expense. Now, our definition of operating expenses are all the fixed costs that typically do not change when we sell one more. I sell one more of my product. I sell one more part. I sell one more label. Operating expenses don't change. Operating expenses tend to be period costs, and they change when I go to a new level. I triple my sales. They're going to go to a new level. But the definition is I sell one more, and these don't change. So these are things like labor, Utilities, maintenance, warehousing, manufacturing costs, general administrative expenses. What's different is that I have labor in there. Okay? That's, that's part of what's different about this. Now, the other definition are those costs that I have to pay because I sold one. I sold one. I sold one more part. I sold one more label. And I had to pay these. These are things like raw materials, purchase part, freight, Outside services, sales commission. I sell one more part, and I'm going to have to pay the raw material. I'm going to have to pay the freight, and I'm going to have to pay the sales commission. Now, I don't sell one. I don't pay these. These vary by the one. Operating expenses, they can go to a new level, but what I'm calling truly variable costs vary by the one. Okay, so let me compare and contrast what we typically do with what I'm saying here. In generally accepted accounting practices, labor is part of cost of goods sold. And all I'm doing is changing what goes up at the top, what goes in that cost bucket, and what goes in the operating expense cost bucket. So let me show you. So here's a typical P&L. We've got the sales minus cost of goods sold. Included in cost of goods sold for most of us, direct labor. True? Okay. Then we get the gross profit. Then we subtract all of our other fixed costs, and we get a profit well, for whatever period we're looking at here. Um, in theory constraints, we use something called throughput accounting, and all we're doing is we're changing the definition of what goes here and what goes here. So I have sales minus those truly variable costs, the cost I have to pay because I sold one. So that's outside services, raw material, sales commission for most of us. That is going to give me the throughput. Notice when I talk about throughput, it's a dollar figure. Throughput is the rate at which we make money. Throughput is how much money I got from my customers minus what I had to pay to generate that sale. Throughput is the rate at which I make money. I then subtract all my fixed costs that didn't change because I sold one, and I get the profit. So the difference is in what, what's going up here and what's going down here. Everybody understand the difference? I haven't yet told you why. I just said that there's a difference. Everybody okay? Okay. So, what does a setup cost? Well, traditionally, we would say the time for the setup times the fully loaded dollars. 
right? The fully loaded direct labor dollars. Is that is that consistent with how you guys might do it? Hello? Okay. <laughs> Can't tell if everybody's just, I got this bright light on me. Um, okay, so that's how most of us do it. That's how they did it in the label company. You can ask any printer, how much does it cost you to do a setup? And they'll say, well, a typical setup is 30 minutes, and they would apply the, the fully loaded dollars, and they tell you exactly how much a setup costs. How much does it really cost? How much does a setup really cost? What? Depends on if it's a constraint or if you're going to lay people off or you don't do it. Well, with how much production you're not getting out while you're setting up. Okay, so in my terms, how much does a setup cost? Something more than direct. So, so what, I'm, what, what I'm saying for a setup is that it doesn't really cost anything. So let's just, let's just think about that for a second. I'm, I'm saying a setup doesn't cost anything. Why? Well, because the people are already there. The machines are already there. You're going to pay them whether you, make, you sell something today or not. They're going to get paid, correct? So those, to me, are operating expenses. How much, how much does it cost us to do a setup? Cost us the time, right? Time is different than cost. It takes time, it uses some of our capacity. But how much does it cost us? Is there an opportunity cost to the lost capacity? Maybe. But remember, label company has excess capacity. They they got a market constraint. But it, but they are using capacity, correct? They are using capacity, but what's the cost? This is an important point. That's why I'm belaboring it a little bit. The cost is, is essentially zero. They didn't have to pay. They, they did the setup. And when they did the setup, they didn't have to pay that employee or that machine as before doing the setup. Now, they're going to have to pay them for their day's work, but they didn't have to pay them for that setup. I mean, unless you pay people by the setup, Setups are essentially free. Now they take our capacity, they use our capacity, that's a different issue, but the cost is zero. Yeah. But doesn't capacity have a cost? And so therefore, shouldn't doesn't that need to be part of the equation? If you're doing more frequent setups and they consume ten percent of your assets. So if we have an internal constraint, if I had a constraint at the printing press, then I would say we'd make the decision I want to know. How much throughput will I generate for how much of my capacity? But I have a market constraint here. I have excess capacity, so how much does the setup cost? In a depressed environment, you're saying the capacity is already there, you're already incurring that, right? Yeah, and I, I'm saying that in every environment except when I have an internal constraint, I have to take the amount of capacity I'm going to use into account. And I would make the decision for how much throughput would I generate for how much of that capacity. Right now, until I get to a point where I've used, I'm getting, I've used uh, almost all my capacity, I say, I have excess capacity. I'm willing to use some of that capacity to do more setups so I can go do this cool offer. What, is the, what does the competition think about this? They think we're going to go bankrupt. Yep. Just basically to drive it towards a pricing strategy that if you have the cost of setups in your pricing, then that may not fit the market. But if you don't price it with your setups, then you have a different price you can take the market. I'm, I'm not advocating anything about pricing. All I'm saying is let's have the real data. I'm not saying you should, should or you shouldn't do anything today. I'm not doing that. All I'm saying is, let's have the real data. Let's be clear. Before we say this mafia offer won't work because we'll go broke doing it, let's be clear. How much will those setups really cost us? And if they really cost us zero, would we do the offer? Yes. But, but aren't, you, aren't you really 
building into your cost structure more money to enable you to, to have that spare capacity, whether or not it's in a down market or an up market. You said earlier that you need at least 30 percent spare excess. capacity yep. excess. So, so in, in fact, it, I guess that's the point. I'm I have saying. to have operating expense to cover the capacity. Yes. So therefore, you have to have a higher level of operating expense. So that's where the cost is. is at. Okay. My operating expense will not be higher because remember in my example. I took the capacity we already had that was at 20s, and I reduced one of them to 15. I did not spend the dime to do that, and I actually got more out. Make sense? What? I know it doesn't make sense. It's the opposite of what we're taught to do. This is the challenging our thinking part. If you really want a monthly offer that works in this recession, this is the kind of thinking you have to do. You have to challenge how how we fundamentally do business. We have to change the rules of the game. And go create an offer that our customers think are fantastic, and the competition goes, "Oh my gosh, still we have a business." Perfect. If your first reaction to your mafia offer, like Gravy's was, was, "You're nuts," we know we're on the right track. Because that's what your that's what your competition is going to think. We have a question. Yeah. You're also assuming that you have excess labor capacity. Yeah, I have excess. In, in the case of the label company, I did. But here, here's what I'm saying. Let me flip to the slide. Here's, here's how I'm saying you should make the decision and why I'm saying it. And I would say this to you, and I've said it to those of you who've been in the Vistage speech, whether you have a market constraint or any kind of constraint, here's how I'm suggesting you make the decision. Make sure that the change in throughput is greater than the change in operating expense. What does that mean? I want to make sure that my throughput is going up faster than my operating expense. If every time you made a decision, the change in throughput was greater than the change in operating expense, what happens to the difference? Drops through. So all I'm saying is, no, no, I'm not saying you should do this or you should do that. I'm saying let's be real about what's actually happening. When we, the question then becomes, should we go forward with the offer? So should we do it? Well, what's the change in operating expense if we go forward with this monthly offer? Do we have to buy any equipment? Do we have to hire any more people? Hello? No. If you have excess capacity. Now, then okay, I'll come back to if we don't, what would we need to do? Then the next question is, how much more do we think we can sell? Well, since our operating expense is zero, the change in operating expense is zero. What's the risk of trying this offer? Zero. Question in the back. I'll agree with you short term, but you have to be cognizant long term. If you wear that machine out and you haven't made enough profit while you're doing this, okay. you're dead in the water. You can't replace it. Okay. So now let me tell you how if if we're going to do this mafia offer, if we're going to do the mafia offer, here's what I'm saying. Every time you're presented with an opportunity, a mafia offer is just an opportunity. You can be presented with the opportunity to work overtime. Or you could be presented with the opportunity, ah, but to do this opportunity, I need to hire one more person. Or to do this opportunity, I need to buy a new piece of equipment. All right, here's how we make the decision. What's the change in throughput I would generate for the monthly offer for the, for working overtime, or if I buy this new piece of equipment? What's the change in throughput? Don't allocate direct labor. Let's be real. What's the change in throughput? How much money will I get from my customers minus? What I had to pay my vendors for those raw materials and outside services and sales commission. That's the money I'm going to generate. That's the money I'm going to be able to use to cover all my operating expenses and make a profit. Now, let's say I'm considering taking on a new customer that's going to require me to buy some new piece of equipment, either an additional piece of something I already have or some new piece. I would ask you, how much more throughput would you generate with this new customer? And what's the change in operating expense from this new piece of equipment? So I'm still accounting for any increases in people or any increases in equipment. I'm just not allocating them up above. I'm just putting them down here. But it gives me the true story, really what's happening, as opposed to when I allocate. It's hard to tell what's really going on. Yes. Would it make sense to say that if the shops 
not busy. He's down 20, 30% on volume. He's trying to decide whether to lay off 10% of his people. One alternative would be to try this for a couple of months and see if offering the smaller lot sizes at the old price allowed him to attract enough additional work that he'd come out ahead. Yeah, in an ideal world, we wouldn't lay off people. We'd sell more. If you have a market constraint, that means that you have more capacity than you can sell right now. The biggest leverage is selling it. Everybody agree with that? The biggest leverage is selling that capacity. Now, if you can't sell it and you need to lay off people because your break-even, operating expense tells us what break-even is, right? This is the nut we have to crack for whatever period this is, a year, a month, whatever. That's how much we have to generate to break even. When you allocate costs out of here to up here, uh-oh, you don't have the true picture of what break-even is anymore because you're allocating based on some volume that may no longer be correct. So all this is saying is let's get the real picture, the true picture. No, you should do this or you should do that. Let's just be, let's be real. Let's understand what's really happening. And every time I'm presented with an opportunity, what's the change in throughput? How much money would I generate if I did it? And will I have to add to my operating expense to do that? If I do, then my operating expense will go to a new level. If I work overtime, that's going to increase my operating expense by that overtime amount. If I stop working overtime, my operating expense goes down. If you were at the opposite, maybe make it clearer, I'm just guessing. If you were at the opposite condition and your capacity constrained, you know, like two years ago, capacity constrained, then you might decide to go the opposite direction and insist on larger lot sizes rather than hiring an additional person or buying an additional machine. Okay, here's what I do when it's the other situation. I ask for every opportunity. I still look at change in throughput, change in operating expense. That still works. I know that the difference will go to the bottom line. That's true in any economic situation. If the throughput I generate is greater than the increase in operating expense I had to incur to generate it, always true. But if I have an internal constraint, in other words, if I take any more business, something's going to be late by definition, correct? If you have an internal constraint, it means we don't have the capacity to process and sell all the orders that we have. So I would look at which one do I prefer, which one should I do. I calculate the throughput per constraint unit for that opportunity. Constraint unit is how much constraint time. If our constraint is the mill, how much throughput dollars will I generate for how much mill time? And in that mill time, this setup is included. So how much throughput for how much of my capacity? When you have an internal constraint, the way you maximize profitability is generate the most amount of throughput for the least amount of your capacity. So it's just a slight change. You have to look at constraint units when you have an internal constraint. When you have a market constraint, all throughput is good throughput. Anybody turning down throughput right now? It's all pretty darn good. Anytime that change in throughput is greater than the change in operating expense, the difference goes to the bottom line. And I'm not saying you should cut prices. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying let's have the real information, though. Let's be really clear on the situation. Shock and awe. Okay. So what were the results? We did this. This was a real case. This was a real printing company. We did it. The printer's profits went from break-even to a 20% return on sales within three months. Three months, 20% return on sales. This stuff works fast, and it's counterintuitive. And the only reason it took three months was it took the owner that long to get his head turned around. This is the opposite of what we do. It's hard to stop doing the other stuff and start doing this. Sales and profits have since doubled, and the profits are now 25% of sales. And in 2009 so far, they're still growing, but at a slightly slower rate. So imagine you need to buy labels. And you can buy from this printer, who says you only need to have two weeks' worth of inventory, two weeks of your cash tied up. 
and guarantees that you always have what you need for the same competitive price, or you can go back to buying them the old way. What do you do? So even in this economy, they're still growing. Not as fast as they were, but they're still growing. But it wasn't easy. Look at all the changes. They had to do the opposite in production. They had to unbalance capacity. Oh, and the finances? They had to stop thinking that every setup was costing them. Nope, it didn't cost them anything. It used some of our capacity, but it didn't cost anything. Okay, so the benefits of a Amalfi offer? Well, a Amalfi offer answers the question, why should I buy from you? If, if right now people say, why should I buy from you, and you have that blah, blah, blah answer, and you're putting them to sleep, we've been in, because we've been in business for 52 years, and we have great people, and you can trust us, and we're very innovative. If you're saying the same stuff everybody else is saying, that's not a Amalfi offer. A monthly offer can help you say, why should I buy from you? Because we don't make you buy from price quantity curve. There are no orders. You just tell us how many you use every day. We guarantee you'll never stock out. And we guarantee you won't have to hold more than two weeks. We're not going to make that guarantee by putting a pile, a mountain of inventory on you. It guides the strategy and tactics for the entire company. That label company, once they had that monthly offer, they knew operationally where they needed to be. They, they also knew, hey, we've got to have a way to deal with that daily consumption data they're going to send us. How are we going to monitor what their inventory levels are for each of those SKUs? They had to put that program in place. But it set the strategy. It set the vision for the company. It's not a label company anymore. They guarantee you never stock out. They don't just sell labels. They make sure that your manufacturing doesn't ever go down. Totally different view. It does force the operational improvements and gives you a reason to do it. It's one thing to go and improve operations. We all want to do that. We all want continuous improvement. But what if you were doing it not just for continuous improvement, but so that you could go do a really cool offer that was going to allow you to increase your sales and profits? That totally changes why do something. And it changes the culture. We're not selling labels. We're selling perfect availability. Every employee, need, every employee knows what we're selling. Do you think they bring any ideas forward that don't have anything, to, that have nothing to do with perfect availability? They're focused on what do we need to do to increase our availability and or reduce the amount of inventory it takes to have that perfect availability. It's a totally different focus. And it can recession proof your company. So far with our clients, uh, worst case scenario, we have some people who have um, are not growing. Their growth has stopped. We haven't had anybody yet go the other direction. I'm not saying that they won't, but a mafia offer does tend to help in this kind of economy. Some of them are still growing, and in worst cases, they're, they're going to be flat from 2008 to 2009. Okay. Coming, coming out of it, though, they're going to have a very quick recovery. It can help you recover from a cash constraint. We helped a client here in California create a Mafia offer who was going to be out of business. Uh, we showed up on Monday, on Friday. On Friday, they could not make payroll. You can, you can create a monthly offer around a cash constraint that you might have or to keep you from getting a cash constraint, but you, you can also create one if your customers have cash constraints. Your offer could be around keeping them from having a cash issue if that's their big issue. And a combination, of course, of the operational improvements provide and end offer provide a huge bottom line benefit. So it would be great if we could just talk about marketing or we could just talk about operations or we could just talk about finance. But remember this chain I started with? We're taught to break our company up into pieces. So we tend to have these different silos 
and we think about it in silos. But what a good leader does is you, you, your job is to think of it as a company as a whole. Because we only make money or lose money as a company as a whole. We don't have departments that make or lose money. So our job as leaders is to make sure we're looking holistically, that we put the company back together. And where to start? I know that this was probably a lot to take in today. How do you, <laughs> what do you do now, right? Well, I, I like to start with the highest throughput. In, 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 in times of recession or this economy, in uncertain times, let's start by creating a mafia offer for our highest throughput products. And here I'm talking about dollars, not percents. Where do we gain the most dollars every time we sell one? a customer, a product, let's create a monthly offer for them. Now you might have, similar to the label company, the label company had one offer that basically worked for any customer that they chose to take it to. And there were some customers who were better candidates for it than others. For example, there was a label company who, let's say they were, they were um, had a customer who they sold stickers to that went on machines. Well, most machine manufacturers know exactly how many machines they're going to produce. They don't have this forecasting problem. They would not be a good candidate for that offer. But, custom, but people who have to forecast, and the forecasts are wrong, and it causes all kinds of... They're very good candidates for the offer. So who are the good candidates for the offer? Short of that, where's the highest throughput? Where do we generate the most throughput dollars every time we sell one? And if your constraints starting to move back internal, I would change that to say, where do I get the most throughput dollars per unit of my scarce resource, per unit of my constraint? Where do I get the most throughput per minute of mill time? That's what I want. Let's go after that business. Let's create a monthly offer around that one. And now let's just wrap up and put this in uh, context of what we heard this week. So I enjoyed uh, spending the week with you and hearing all the speakers. And this is my summary of what I heard and in context of what I presented today. So one of the things we heard is that vision and personal responsibility are what we need. So what I said is, okay, well, let's talk about what should that vision be. Maybe the vision should be a monthly offer that says, this, sets, this tells us exactly what we need to do. How much operations need to improve, how we need to think about finances differently, how we're going to go to the market. So now we have a specific way to think about that vision. And we need to be the banker. If you're using cost allocation, cost accounting to make decisions, you might not be, you, you may not be the best banker you could be. If every time an opportunity presented itself, you asked yourself, what would the change in throughput be compared to the change in operating expense? And every time you made a decision, your profits increased, we could probably look at that. That's how I interpreted being a banker. And we need to be ready towards the end of 09. If you're not at 100% duty performance right now, and your sales are down, or if you're only at 100% because your sales are down, now's a good time. Let's make sure we get operations ready to go. At the end of 2009, the people that are going to have huge opportunities are the ones that can deliver it the fastest, the least amount of time. And if you could guarantee it, boy, wouldn't that be powerful? Because when, when they're ready to go, they're going to be ready to go. We heard the inventories are coming down. At some point, that switch is going to flip. And if we're in a position to respond because we have, we're lean, we have little work in process, and when we get an order, it just zips through, we're going to be able to take advantage. And we need to do something nobody else wants to do. Nobody wants to do more setups, except for a couple people in this room that I've heard about recently. Right? We'll take the setups. Every, every other printer is looking, looking for the perfect long run that they can set up the press and run for a week. We're going to set up the press continuously. We're going to do a lot more setups. And what, another interesting thing that happened when we started doing more setups is we got pretty good at setups. And the amount of time it took us to do a setup actually reduced. Whatever gets your attention and your focus as the leader, is what you're going to get good at. And we also need to be courageous and willing to take coaching. I know that the stuff that I'm talking about 
is the opposite. And, and right now, as human beings, we have this yes but machine. And every time I say something, it's natural for us to say yes but, what about this? And yes but, what about that? That's not the coach. That's the little voice trying to keep you from improving. Tell it thank you for sharing and continue to challenge your assumptions. And then Ron told us that if every day we're a better leader than we were yesterday, we're certainly moving in the right direction. And for me, that leader, the, the companies that, that we work with that are most successful are the leader who says, this is what we're going to do. And we're going we're to put in, we're, we're going to go out with this mafia offer, and to do that mafia offer, here's how operations need to change. And this is how we're going to do business. And it's amazing how fast it can happen. On the other hand, you work with somebody who doesn't have that leadership, and I'll tell you, it doesn't happen. It takes six months, nine months, a year, two years to get the same results you should get in three months. So here's my recommended next steps. Improve your ops. Now's the time. Get better. Be at 100%. Just pretend that if you didn't deliver when you said, you'd have to pay a penalty. And start adding up what those would be. That would be interesting, right? Then develop a mafia offer. You can do one and two concurrently. Develop a mafia offer. How are you now going to take advantage of that operational excellence that you have? And the offer should be customized for you, your capabilities compared to your competitors, your industry, and your specific customers. So I gave you the three guidelines. It needs to be customized for you. And you really have to challenge your assumptions. You have to challenge how you do this today. Take market share. Why not? If you sold at the same competitive price but did it better, faster, whatever, couldn't you take market share even in this economy? Then buy up the competitors. The people who are retreating, they're just cutting people, they're getting worse on due date, they're getting worse on lead time. Then they start to lose the customers they have because they're getting worse. And they're not paying attention to their operating expense where break even is. They've got the numbers all mixed up and they don't even have the true number of what break even is. The next thing you know, they're in trouble. And finally, stay focused. This is probably the best, even if you don't do what, I, what I've suggested today, and all I'm doing is giving you some guidelines to think differently, Whatever you decide to do, I will tell you that if you stay focused, you're going to do way better at it than if you bounce around. So choose what you're going to do, communicate it, be a great leader, and then just stay focused. It's not the flavor of the week. So here's what we're going to do, and here's why. Okay, so that is the end of my formal presentation. And now that I have everybody perfectly quiet, <laughs> still in shock and awe, um, let me take any questions that you have. You mentioned a formula. Yes. Yeah. What was that? A formula for what? what that? Excel. That Excel formula you mentioned that was the Oh, the Monte Carlo simulation? Monte Carlo? Yeah. What about it? I'm just asking what that was again. Oh, it was called a Monte Carlo simulation, and it's an add-in that you have to put into Excel. And you just set up the parameters, and then you can run the simulation. I ran it a thousand times. I got a distribution, and the average of that distribution was just under 10. It was 9 point something. And I just rounded up to 10. And it just seems way too depressing to think of it less than 10. <laughs> Yes. Can you explain a little more about the throughput accounting? Any particular question? Or? Well, you said the main difference is you take out the labor and you put it labor and operating expenses. See, actually, for us, um, we can't do that because, well, we already have 
what, book accounting, tax accounting, government accounting. <laughs> this is a different kind of accounting. Um, so you're looking at taking direct labor out of cost of goods sold and putting it into operating expenses. Yeah. So that's the major difference? That's the main difference. The, the key, and I'm not saying you have to redo your books. I just put this up to explain the differences. So you don't have to redo your books. The key is that you use this to get the real situation and to make decisions. So I'm suggesting use it to make decisions. And I would say, okay, what would, notice here, this tells us that the break even we need in whatever this period is, is this 4,983. And this tells us it's $6,000. Will the true break even please stand up? What, what happens on this side is we're allocating direct labor up here, and that allocation has some assumption about a volume. Well, if that volume is not correct, then this side is going to lead you astray. So what I'm saying is just use the throughput accounting to come up with <laughs> the best, the real situation and to help you make the best decision possible. So I've got sales minus the cost I have to pay because I sold one. So raw materials, the heat treater, the plater, the uh, sales guy, those are my two, those I have to pay because I sold one. If I don't sell one, I don't have to pay. Okay, so you're saying you're paying that labor no matter what. You're paying it no matter what. I mean, isn't that true for most of us that if we, if we sell nothing today, if you sold nothing today because you're not at the shop, you still have to pay those guys, right? So that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying get to the real deal. They still have to do financial reporting. Yeah, you, you still need to do financial reporting and tax reporting. So do that. I'm just saying, I'm suggesting a different way to think and make decisions. <clears throat> yes? I think you've always told not to sell at variable cost. Yes. Because it, it will go, because then you lose money eventually. Maybe if you differentiated what you're recommending from the theory of, from, from trying to sell at variable cost, that would help clarify the issue. Okay, so when, when you're told don't sell at variable cost, um, that is is different than what I'm saying. Okay, first of all, variable cost typically is your, what I'm calling truly variable cost plus the direct labor, right? And how most of us price is we um, can say, well, here's what raw materials are, and we mark up raw materials, and then we say, here's how much time it's gonna take, and we have some fully loaded um, that we apply to that time, and then we add a reasonable margin, whatever that is, and that's how we come up with the price. And so conventional wisdom is don't sell for, what was it, marginal? Variable margin. Uh, don't sell for, 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 your, for your variable cost. They're saying add a margin on that, okay? All I'm saying, and I, I've had no, I, I haven't said you should or shouldn't do anything. What I'm saying is that when, when you look at taking business, I want you to think about how much throughput will you generate from that business. If I take that job, I, I'm gonna get $1,000 for it. My raw materials, my sales commission, my um, outside services are $200. I'm gonna generate $800 in throughput. And that's the throughput I'm gonna generate. Now, I'm gonna generate that amount of throughput no matter how long it takes me to do that job. Everybody with me on that? One of my pet peeves is one of my clients um, slip up and say something like, we lost money on that job. Why do we generally say something like, we lost money on that job? Why do we say it? No, why, why do we say it? What, what happened that caused us to say it? It took too long. It took longer than we estimated. When we estimated that job, we said it's going to take this amount of time. Then let's say the job took twice as long as we estimated. We tend to say we lost money on that job. Why? Because we allocated more dollars. I'm saying, no, you still generated the same throughput. You still generated $800 in throughput no matter how long it took you. Now, would it be better if it took you less time? Yes, because you're using capacity. But don't confuse capacity and time with the dollars we generate. We still generated $800 no matter how long it took us. And that's, what I, that, that's the main point. Again, no shoulds or should nots. 
I just want you to realize you generated $800 through Yeah. We do all of our jobs costing you, and the bottom thing we look for is the throughput per hour. Is that the same principle, or is that still? Well, if you're doing job costing, it tells me you're allocating. So if you're allocating, you're not doing this. There's no allocation in this. So you're still probably allocating allocating direct labor. Well, we can have a stack of work. Take all the expenses out. Yeah. And then we take what's left and divide it by the number of hours it took to do it. And that's what our throughput is per hour. And we have, you know, we try to keep that aside. I, I need to look at it closer and see. As long as you don't have any allocated cost in it, then I like throughput per hour, as long as it's throughput across the control point, very good number. If you look across all your machines, <coughs> not so good. But if you look at that control point, that can be a very good number. Yeah. Okay. Question? I don't know whether this is a question or perhaps it, uh, it's an illustration of your theory. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> I'll give an example. I spoke to some of the other members about this particular situation that we had in our company. John and I uh, did this listening to you when you came to our business group in Pittsburgh. We had an opportunity to, to work with a customer, and uh, we decided we weren't going to use any of our own labor because they were busy doing other things. So we priced this basically on the temporary labor that we were going to uh, hire, plus the uh, cost of the raw materials, yes. and then simply added a profit margin to that. Yes, we allocated none of our own overhead or anything to that. Perfect. And how did that work out for you? Uh, spectacularly. <laughs> uh, we, we probably are having an 18% uh, net profit margin from that. So you generated good throughput? Huge amount of throughput. Huge amount of throughput. Uh, a third of our overall business. Oh, also. only a third. <laughs> he only added a third more throughput. What, what, what does that mean? If he... He, he increased his operating expense because he had some temporary people. So the difference of between the, the uh, and I don't know, you might have considered that uh, the additional people is truly variable cost. But anyway, the net difference between that. Well, we, we, we capture overhead based on uh, labor dollars. And since they were none of our labor dollars, none of our people, okay. we didn't allocate any overhead. So our theory was that we were busy, completely busy, and we just... Uh, those those labor those overhead costs were being allocated to our other customers. So we we simply just took the truly variable cost yeah. and added a margin to that and then sold that. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. But that was our example. No, that's not that's not bad. Now I want to beat you up for the uh, still allocating and everything else, right? <laughs> well. Yeah, you have to come and help us do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. But I can tell you that whatever, we, we would not have costed this thing. I mean, okay, when we priced it to the customer, if we had done it in our typical fashion. You wouldn't have won the job. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even come close to winning the job. Okay. Anybody else have, have apply any of this from here and speak before that has a similar story? I, I just yeah. want to follow up on what Jeff said. Yeah. Um, you know, in the perspective that, that I put this in, you know, now we have not gone to a throughput accounting, but we were able to take on the business without adding any overhead, we did not have to add machine tools. We did not increase what we considered our fixed costs. No budget change, no additional cost was incurred by the organization, but we brought in a significant amount of revenue at a significant margin. Uh, and just, just want to kind of endorse uh, your principles here. No, we're not falling to the T, but I would not even have had that thought process that I thought heard your presentation and, and thought outside of the box of the conventional cost structure. So, okay, thank you. just kind of want to endorse. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, any other comments, questions? Thank you. Things to go over, but does anybody? I've had a mafia offer. It's on my website. I've had it for I don't know three or four years. It's 
just to show you where I didn't uh, buy into it. We were going to go to, you know, we all have customers that call us and say, I need you to, to give me my parts in a week. And many times we jump through hoops and we give them their parts in a week, but we don't charge them any extra. We just do it because they're a really good customer and we've already been late before and it's makeup. So Lisa came in and said, well, why are you giving that away? You need to charge more. So we developed a matrix pricing and we started quoting to some of our customers this matrix pricing. And the penalty was that if, if you wanted it in a week, there was a multiplier on it. If you wanted two weeks as a multiplier, and three weeks as a multiplier, and four weeks, their average delivery was four weeks, you paid the regular price. But we let our customers pick. And But if we were late, say we missed, they, they, they purchased a one-week delivery, and we missed it by an hour or a day, we give them a credit on their invoice of the next level. So if they ordered it in one week and we delivered it in two weeks, we, got, we were going to get the two-week price to show the penalty on the invoice for that. The really interesting part about all this is that I didn't think any of our customers would do it. All of a sudden, it was taken. A lot of them loved it because they could go back to their engineers and say, well, do you really want it in a week? If you do, here's... And so people started picking what times they really wanted parts, which allowed us more flexibility in our schedule. But the really big marketing impact was the times that we paid the penalty or that the cause of the invoice PO variance, which the, the accounting department was coming to purchase and say, what are we going to do? These people took a discount. We don't have any of it. And, and it would cause so much things going on. Why would this company give us money back? Why would they do that? It ended up being such a, a marketing tool that they said, wow, this is really cool. You're really, they're talking about you around here. Any company that would give, pay a penalty, a volunteer penalty, was the most awesome thing. It ended up generating more business from that, those customers than not. Now, the nice part about that thing, and it doesn't work so much in a recessionary environment, there was extra money for us because then we let our customers select. It's like you go in and buy, you've got three, three different size Cokes to buy, and you, you, you pick the one that best suits you, but they're driving you. In turn, the pricing is driving you to buy what you perceive as the best value, and it's actually buying probably the most profitable Coke or whatever when you're, you're picking a selection. So that, that's what it did for us. And, and it was kind of, it blew me away because I never thought anybody would jump on it, and they did.